Father God, you know my every thought And you know my ways, the path on which I walk And you know me better than I know myself You've known me longer than anyone else. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. And I can't even understand. Good morning, Oasis Church. So excited to be here with you this morning. Yes, hello everybody. So happy to be with you from your lounge or your home um, to celebrate a lovely another Sunday together. Yeah. 
So we're going to jump straight into the announcements. Um, so the first one is that during July, we ran a competition to see who was reading and engaging in the monthly newsletters. And so the competition was run and the winner is Sean Hills. Yay. So Sean, oh, well done. You won the competition. So there's a voucher coming your way, bud. Yes, congratulations, Sean. Our next announcement is the Kindness Project. Um, you should know, Oasis family, that the Kindness Project has gained such wonderful momentum in the community, mm. even so much so that other churches have heard yeah. of your acts of kindness, random acts of kindness, and they're wanting to jump on board, get involved. So well done. Keep going. People are, are being blessed. People are being encouraged through kindness and um, it doesn't cost anything. So mm. yay, we can all do it. We can all get involved. Mm. And um, yeah, whether it's stopping to help someone across the road, whether it's making a meal, whether it's yeah. fetching someone's kids from school or whether it's picking up rubbish as you drive past, um, all of those little acts make a big difference. Mm. So yeah, as a family, yeah. let's go for yeah, it. Yeah, let's do it. Hi there. We interrupt your normal broadcast to bring you an important behind the scenes message. I'm Gus. And this is Sean, and this is Matt. You won't have seen their faces because they're generally behind the scenes. So I'm here to ask them a few questions about what happens after we record and what do we have to do to get where we get so that you have this incredible product that you get to watch every Sunday. So Sean, you do the visual side of things, the film work and stuff like that. Tell me about yeah. where we've been, where we've come from and where we are now and where we're going. Yeah, so um, when I started here, we were filming in a tiny room with a small phone uh, on like these awful luminescent lights, like fluorescent light looking things that were just hideous. Um, so bad, really bad. Really bad, really <laughs> bad. Uh, but we've made continuous improvements over the weeks as we've learned how to, how to light things properly and everything like that. And hopefully now, you know, things are looking a lot better. Um, and we're using... I mean, at the, we still use phones sometimes, but we also use my DSLR camera like we are at the moment. Um, yeah, so... What's the, what's the next step? So, so we're using a DSLR, but yeah. I mean, that tops out about 12 minutes because of the, the file size, file am I right? Yeah. So we get, we, we're recording and every 12 minutes, the person who's preaching or the person who's recording has got to go, whoa, whoa hang on, uh, let's pause that thought. And then we've got to edit that back together. Yeah. And that takes a lot of time. So, yeah. so what do we need to do to improve that? What's the next step? Yeah, so we're looking at a, at a camera that can film uh, continuously for like until we run out of storage. Completely. Like a studio camera. Um, yeah, yeah, essentially. Um, and that'll help us uh, as we move forward as well into the future um, to be able to record live um, too, uh, just because obviously we can't stop every 12 minutes in a live. It's hard. I've, I've done it preaching. It's, it's so difficult. It's, it's like terrible, you're yeah. in the middle of your thought and you're about to deliver this incredible piece of revelation. Stop. Yeah. And then yeah. you're going to be like, Oh, what was I saying? What was it? Oh. Yeah, and you lose all of that passion and everything, and it sucks for editing afterwards. Okay, because you got to put all the pieces back together. Yeah, yeah. How, how many? I mean, just on in general, how many hours a week are you spending on editing for the Sunday? Uh, the Sunday thing is typically about six hours. Okay. It, it can be pushed up to eight. Yeah, especially when depending on how many cuts you got to put together and how many bloopers there were and yeah. things like that. Yeah, that's really that's a lot. And then I mean, you guys are also doing other stuff for us. You've done like the prophetic words. And if yeah. we've got other video coming through, so you guys are putting in a lot of hours. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the audio side. So the audio side, we also started on phones, yeah. Matt. Uh, are we better than that now? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit better than phones now. Cool. So what are we doing? What do we do? What were the steps that we took? And what are the next steps? Uh, we first started off by getting the Zoom H6, mm -hmm. which helped drastically. Yeah, yeah. We got some nice condenser microphones, which also improved the sound yeah. immensely. So the quality is improving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every week. That's great. So, yeah. And then you do editing, and people don't know this, but they can hear the difference, and I'm sure they've been appreciating it. So, how much editing are you putting in on the Sunday message? Also a decent amount. It's also about every two minutes per minute roughly ish okay so it's, double whatever the, the length is and then any bloopers you've got to cut back together yeah, yeah. and you've got to work with sean because we've got to audio sync everything together so if there is a cut you've got to tell sean oh by the way we took this piece out and we put that put in and and so you guys have got to like piece this together like a, a mosaic afterwards <laughs> <laughs> pretty much like an, <laughs> like an artist. Like an artist. These guys are definitely artists. Um, and so what's the next step? So we've got the H6 Zoom. That's great. But I mean, we're going to be looking as things progress. We're going to be moving back into the hall. We've got upper yeah. room that's happening. What do we need to yeah. do next? So we're going to be looking at upgrading the sound in the main hall. So we can start recording live 
our okay. main church services for when church goes back and the worship sessions that yeah. we are having now at the upper rooms. Yeah, that's amazing. So we've already started working on some worship stuff. I mean, you guys had the guys in yeah. uh, Sunday ago and and they were recording and they were, you've been building MIDI tracks. I mean, putting 10 hours plus in on a song so that the track is built so that when they come and record, they can just do the vocals and they don't have to do all the instruments. Yeah. So we're essentially running a small studio. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Okay, so that's what we're doing. And the next steps in sound is going to be the, the digital desk, am yeah. I right? Yeah. So we're looking at a Yamaha hard desk and yeah. that's so that we can interface everything so those are the next two steps that that we need to do in terms of hardware and um, if you're sitting at home and you're saying well what can i do well if you have skills if you know some of the skills that these guys have got and you'd like to help out we're really looking for people to help us um, we need people to do sound we need people to help with editing and things like that and then we're also looking for hardware the dslr camera that we're using is not sufficient we have to move to a studio camera that's about forty thousand rand um, that we're looking at for a camera there yeah and then there's about 80,000 Rand that we need to spend on the desk and then improvements yeah. from there. But the next steps, we're looking at 40,000 on visual and about 80,000 on uh, audio. So if you want to give towards that, you can use the reference revamp um, and you can give in, in that direction. And what we're doing is we're just broadening the scope of where the message goes. So every week we get these incredible messages and we want to make sure that it's not limited to just the people that are in our congregation, but we want to be producing world-class production quality um, stuff so that we can send it out and people can benefit from it all over the world. So that's what you can do. That's what we're doing behind the scenes. And if you want to know more, please contact myself or speak to one of these guys. We'd love to tell you more about the technical side of things. We're passionate about it. We love it. Yeah, yeah. And we love sharing the gospel through that. Have a great day. Thanks. Cheers. Guys, we're going to go into the time of worship now. So I'm excited about this. As worship leaders, we, we always enjoy this time. So I just want to encourage you, get up, get out of your chair and just, um, just enter into an amazing time of worship with him. Yes. And part of our worship is giving. So mm. well done, our Aces family, for giving yeah. towards um, uh, the tithes, the offerings, the Acts 2 fund. Mm. There is another way to give. And the COVID-19 fund has been such a wonderful, yeah. wonderful way of supporting the 51 families that we have been supporting. The fund has run dry, though. So yeah. I just want to encourage you that um, that fund really does um, support and look after so many so if we can continue to give if you can sow into that that would be so wonderful yeah. keep supporting keep reaching out to those in need yeah um so yeah go for it guys yeah go for it we so, give because we love yeah so let's <laughs> so, yeah. so let's have a good time of worship yeah. enjoy it yeah thank you lord for just a wonderful time of engaging in your presence i thank you father that as people worship in faith that you would touch hearts today mm. and that you would release your presence in jesus name mm. amen amen When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Oh, the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, you won't. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. For every war he wages, he will win. Oh, I'm not backing down from any giant. Oh, I know, I know how this story ends. Yes, I know. Yes, I know.
take the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good yeah, yeah. You take the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Yes, you do You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good You turn it for good oh, no. Boy, You take the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good
You're never gonna You're never gonna me down You're never gonna You're never gonna me down You're special time mm, of worship yeah. I really trust that your hearts were engaged and that you really enjoyed the presence yeah. of God with us yeah so we're looking forward to the to the preach and we've got the wonderful Donny Hoggerty who's going to share with us and continue with our influence series so yes. enjoy Good morning and welcome to another beautiful opportunity to share the Word of God together. It's always such a privilege to hear what God is saying. And I think over the last couple of weeks, He has been speaking so loudly and so clearly to us. It's such a privilege to be right on the cutting edge of what God is saying to us as a church family. And so this is the seventh week of our Influence series. And at this point, I thought it might be quite a good idea to just stop and reflect on what it is that we've been talking about, what it is that we've learned, so that we don't just get a whole of information, but we can actually have a Selah moment to stop and think on the things that God is talking to us about as a church family. So the very first week kicking off this influence series was Julian Adams. And he spoke to us about the fact that influence looks like servanthood. Do you remember he used the analogy where Jesus talks about the field of the wheat and the tares, where the farmer had sowed the wheat and then the evil man had come and sowed the tares. And the farmer said, what am I supposed to do? And Jesus said, let them grow up together because when they are fully grown, the wheat will bow over and you'll be able to see the difference between the two. And he spoke to us about the fact that when you are bowed down low and when you are full of fruit, just like the wheat, that is when you are able to impact the world around you. It comes from that position of servanthood, that position of fruitfulness, that position of actually giving of yourself to the community around you and what comes is multiplication. We then had Matt talking to us about writing on the canvas of darkness, how often we see darkness um, as something that's bad and negative when actually Jesus is telling us that it was out of darkness that everything was created. When God said, let there be light, it came from a place of darkness. And God is giving us this canvas of darkness to be able to create a new narrative. He spoke to us about that little Syrian girl who said to Naaman, go and see the prophet of my people. She was a little girl who was in captivity, who was in a terribly dark dark situation and yet she took that moment of darkness to create a completely new narrative. You see passion comes from being seated in the place of a different perspective and being able to see from God's perspective. Then it was me and I spoke about the fact of how influence looks like love. It's knowing what love is. It's being sincere in the love that Jesus has given us. It's stopping and noticing the one above their sin or their horrible situations and seeing the person and releasing and ushering in the kingdom of life and the kingdom of love and Jesus to everybody around us. 
Then we had Daryl Bain from Ireland and he spoke to us about emergency encouragement. Do you remember that? He spoke to us about the fact that we need to be encouraging each other all the time, that we need to be seeing what is truth about people and calling them up to their truest identity and making an effort. I can't tell you how many times I think beautiful things about people and then I forget for it to come out of my mouth. And we need to be people who actually make an effort to encourage people around us. We are starving. We are thirsty. We are parched for an encouragement from people around us and we need each other. And then we had um, Tommy who told us that we need to see the things that God is seeing and speak the words that God is speaking. He used the analogy of David being in the cave and he had the bats flying around him and he had the dark space and yet he still chose to see and to speak the things that God is seeing and speaking, that our vision needs to be set on things above, that we need to be seated with Christ. And then last week we had Matt and Matt spoke to us about the fact that Faith helps us to turn things right side up, that we may perceive things a certain way, but when it's activated by faith, it's turned the right way up. And there are two steps to help us do that. One of them is gratitude and the next one is consistency. I think if we look at the flow of what we've learned about in the last seven weeks, there are some really beautiful handles in order to help us become people who act actively live out the things that God has called us to be. And how can we help but see transformation in the world around us if we keep on doing these things, if we actually walk in step with the Spirit constantly, setting our affections on things above and not on earthly things? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 13, this is what he says, this just gentle reminder and encouragement. He says, remember to stay alert and hold firmly to all that you believe. Be mighty and full of courage. Let love and kindness be the motivation behind all you do. I love this scripture because in this scripture, Paul is giving a very firm exhortation to the church in Corinth and he's telling her to be vigilant. That word vigilant means to be on your guard against things that are coming against you and causing you to be subtly led away from what you believe to be true. You know, in this beautiful journey of life that we're on, the Father is giving us an invitation to become the people that he had always planned for us to become. And sometimes this journey is completely glorious and wonderful and amazing and we are so excited at the good things that God has for us. And sometimes this journey is really difficult and really hard and it feels like we are going through a valley that we don't even know where it came from. One day it was good and the next day it feels really difficult. I know I'm not the only one that experiences this and I know that in your life you can see this part of your journey too. But it is in the testing of our faith that we become the people that God has called us to be. So we get things, we hear information, we get that information. It's called knowledge and it goes into our minds where we go, I believe this to be true about God. It is a belief that we hold, except while it is still just in our minds, it is at a place that is incredibly fragile and incredibly vulnerable because the enemy wants to rob that seed away. It's like the parable of the sower and the seeds where he sowed it on the different ground and some of the seeds was just snapped up by a bird. And so what happens is when we encounter a situation that starts to test our belief, we need to be very vigilant and on our guard that the enemy doesn't steal that belief away and we lose all our faith and confidence in who God is because of the situations and the circumstance. So let me give you a little example of this. When I was about 21, I went overseas to America and you know, the land of the brave and, and the land of the free and all wonderful things and amazing things happen in America. And one of the amazing things that happened was that just... 40 minutes away, it wasn't far at all from the little town that we were in, there was a third day Michael W. Smith concert and I wanted to go with everything inside of me. It was going to cost me $50, which was a lot of money even in those days. And I really, really wanted to go to this concert and I asked God for the opportunity to go and I spoke to the guy who was heading up our trip and he said, no, I'm sorry, I don't think you can go. So I said, why don't we all go? I mean, like, how cool is this? A bunch of Christian young people, I'm sure going to a concert is like the best thing we could possibly do on a night like tonight. And he said, nobody else really wants to go, it's just you, and I don't think it's possible. So I went to the father and I said, God, I really, really, really want to go to this concert. And it just seems like there's no way that's possible. And I felt an audible voice of the Holy Spirit say to me, you will go to that concert and you will not pay for the ticket. And I was like, no ways. That's amazing. Like, how cool is that? And immediately, once you've had that thought, there's all the thoughts that come across that go, oh, maybe it was just me. Maybe I'm just really hoping for something. But I knew that God had spoken to me. And what I want to say is the very first part of belief 
is knowing that you have heard the voice of God. I just want to stop here for a minute and I want to paint a picture for you. I want you to imagine God sitting on his throne. There's angels, there's wild color, there's noise, there's lightning, there's thunder, there's creatures that look completely different to our imaginations, there's the Holy Spirit brooding, and there's life, there's Jesus, heaven is the most incredibly colorful, vibrant, beautiful place, and then God speaks. And as he declares something, it is already established, and all of these witnesses in the heavenly realm have heard what God has said. And then we hear those words, and it's called prophecy. And we take the prophecy from somebody or what the Holy Spirit has spoken into our own hearts and we go, wow, that is amazing. And sometimes we steward it and sometimes we forget about it. But what we don't understand is that once it has been spoken in that heavenly realm, where all of heaven has heard what God is saying, both the powers of light and the powers of darkness, it has been established and that is the plan and the purpose and the intention of God. And we can so easily have that little faith moment stolen away from us if we are not vigilant to hold firmly onto the belief that God has put inside of our hearts. And so yeah, I'm in this moment where God has spoken to me and he's told me I'm going to go to this concert and I'm not even going to pay for the ticket. So this is like 10 o'clock in the morning. The concert's like 7 o'clock that night. It's 40 minutes away. I don't have a car. I don't know how I'm going to get there. And I feel like the Holy Spirit's spoken to me. And the next minute, the leader of our trip comes to me and he says, hey, I've just had a phone call from one of the leadership couples in the church and they said they would like to take you to the concert. They'll buy a ticket for you and then you can reimburse them. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get to go to the concert. That is amazing. Oh, God told me I wouldn't pay for the ticket, but but okay, just go ahead and organize it because because it's happening and I'm so excited. And so we got back, we were going white water rafting that day, got back, managed to quickly freshen up, get in the car, paid my $50 to them, rushed off the 40 minutes away to get to the concert. So excited that I got to be here. I mean, it's like an absolute dream come true. And we get out the car and we rush in because the concert's starting now. You know, we've just like made it in the nick of time. And I run up to the front door. And as I run up to the front door, this man comes to me and he says, hey, I've been waiting for you. I have a free ticket for you. And I was like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. The Holy Spirit had said to me, you are going to go to this concert and you won't pay for the ticket. And yeah, I've already spent the $50. I have a ticket in my hand. And what he had promised me, I totally lost sight of because I wasn't holding on to the belief that God was good and the promises that he spoke over me, he would do. You see, the hallways of the church are littered with people who, because of difficulty, because of confusion, because they have just not been able to see the goodness of God in their situation, have given up on what God is doing in their life on what God has spoken over their life. They've opted out for a life that doesn't reflect his glory. They've opted out for a life that is completely doable in the natural realm. And God is not looking for a people who are comfortable with living completely according to the natural realm. God is looking for a people who are comfortable living out of our comfort zone, out of the place where I can control everything, out of the place where it's all about what I can do and there's no place for the Holy Spirit. He's looking for people who are completely awakened and alive to him. It reminds me of the story of somebody who didn't doubt the promises of God, like my story where I did. And that's a man named Joseph. He was spoken over by his father, just like I was in my story. He had dreams and he had visions that he was going to rule over a nation. And the journey that he had, we all know that story. He was forsaken by his brothers. He was sold as a slave. He then became a slave and rose to a high prominent position. He was then basically accused of, of um, being in a relationship that was not healthy. He was thrown into prison and he rose to that position. He interpreted dreams for people and said, don't forget about me. And he was forgotten about. I mean, he had every good reason to doubt the promises of God. And yet a day came. A day came when his character that God was busy forming in him was ready for the mantle and authority that God had for him. And I want to suggest to us as a church, there are very, very many of us who are so close to walking into the fullness of what God has for us, but we may have lost sight of the goodness of God in our journey. We may have lost sight of the things that God has spoken. And you know what? I'm reminded of that picture. I'm sure you've seen it on Facebook or online somewhere of a man who's digging for diamonds and literally with his pick fork, he has one more hit to go before he has this massive um, vein of diamonds that he finds and he turns around and he walks away because he thinks he's never going to find it. 
so often in our lives, guys, we are minutes away from what God has for us. And we turn around and we walk away and opt for a life that is completely doable in our own strength. You see, here's Joseph. He never did that. Even in the times when he was most discouraged, he knew God had spoken a promise over him. And because of that promise, he refused to let go. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, 11, that he counted him who made the promise faithful. God is faithful, even when I do not feel like I have that faith inside of me. So how do we become those people that do not have our journey of destiny stolen away from us because of our discouragement, because of our belief being robbed away? How do we become those people? Well, going back to that scripture in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says, remember to stay alert and to hold firmly to what you believe. And his very next sentence says, be mighty and full of courage. That word courage, as we all know, is to stand in the face of fear and still do what you believe anyway. It doesn't mean not being afraid. It means still feeling that fear, still being completely aware of my situation and circumstance, still being completely aware of what's really going on around me, but choosing a higher value and a higher perspective regardless and fighting for something that's greater than the fear that's in front of me. In the Bible, it tells us that that word courage means to prevail by God's dominating strength. In other words, it means tapping into a realm that is way beyond our strength and understanding. It's tapping into the supernatural realm of God's strength, where the Bible tells us to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. What he's saying is become firm and firmly convicted in the courage that I've put inside of you by the strength of the Father, not by the strength of the Son. It means to show yourself as brave as people who will not be shaken. You know, when Jesus was in that storm and he was sleeping and the disciples were like, oh my gosh, we're going to die. Jesus stood up and he showed himself as brave. He was not shaken. Do you think Jesus was scared of the storm and the waves? I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was slightly nervous by the fact that the boat's going all over the place. He can hardly stand straight. He's got all of these people's lives that he's responsible for. And then he goes, but I'm plugging into the strength of one that's greater than me because God has spoken. And right now is not my time for my life to end. I've got a plan and a purpose in heaven. And he spoke stillness over the storm that was coming to fear and intimidate him. <clears throat> you see, going into the promised land takes courage. We all know that story in Joshua where the angel said to him, be strong and very courageous. Being courageous is plugging into a strength that is greater than your strength. The problem is, however, that the things that fight against courage are all in our head, aren't they? It's the belief that I don't have what it takes. It's the belief that I'm just not enough. It's the belief that I don't know if God's really going to come through for me. It's the belief that I failed before and I feel like this time I'm going to fail again. And those are all unspoken things. We don't necessarily tell people around us what it is that we're actually thinking. And sometimes we don't even know what the things are that's coming against our courage because we're so used to those words being in our head. And when the angel said to Joshua, be strong and very courageous, what he was saying to him is choose courage, buddy. Choose courage. Because there are going to be things that come against your courage that are going to make you think you don't have what it takes. And the truth is, you don't. But you're not doing it in your own strength. You're doing it in the strength of the Father who has everything that it takes. And as soon as we can rise up our ability and our understanding to the belief we have of the Father, things break through in our lives. We've been given some incredible handles on this influence series. But in reality, are any of these things going to become part of who we are? Only if we choose courage in order to turn our belief into something that is part of who we are. We don't have to think about being people who serve the community around us. We just naturally do it. We don't have to think about people who write on the canvas of darkness. We just naturally do it. And this journey is called courage. Courage is the choice and the willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, and intimidation. Courage includes all aspects of perseverance and patience. You know, I don't actually think that God is intimidated by time. You know, we hear the story of, of Abraham and Sarah and we're all like, whoa, for such a long time they trusted God for a baby. And then at the very last moment, oh my gosh, God, what are you doing? I don't think God is intimidated by time. He's not controlled by time like we are. In fact, he is the creator of time and time was meant to be a blessing to us. What God is more interested is in us being transformed into his likeness. And so the very DNA of courage is being comfortable with perseverance and comfortable with patience. 
God likes those silent moments. Those silent moments where we are no longer the ones that are speaking, but we have completely surrendered. Surrender means I actually trust you, God, in every area of my life. So often we say we trust God, and then as soon as there's a little bit of a wobble, we take all of that back and we try to do it on our own strength, don't we? I could put my hand up, I do it all of the time. But what God is looking for is a people who are completely, utterly, totally dependent and reliant on the full character of God that we no longer look at our own ability as if in some way it's greater than his. That's what courage is all about. Courage is the deliberate choice in the face of pain or fearful circumstances for the sake of a worthy goal. You know, Paul says to us that the trials that we are facing are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us. And I want to say, guys, courage is the journey of holding on to the glory that will be, that will be revealed to us. And what I'm going through right now will end. What I'm going through right now may seem like it's never going to come to an end. You know, it's difficult when you believe that there's something valuable inside of you and nobody else seems to see that value. How do you carry on in that moment when you believe that what you have to give to the world is amazing and yet it feels like every door around you is shut? Do you give up and go, oh, well, you see, it was never going to happen for me anyway? Or do you say, I will hold on confidently to the word that my father has spoken because he who has spoken is faithful? You know, the amazing thing is that the original root word of courage means heart. It means Latin for heart. And in fact, it doesn't at all mean that superhero moment where you got to do something courageous and change the world. It actually talks about the state of your heart, the wellness that's going on inside of you. It means to speak one's mind by telling one's heart. What I think is amazing is that I told you a little bit earlier, when we get information that touches our heart, it is called it is called knowledge. That knowledge we can say is part of us, but as soon as you have to try and remember what it is you should say in a certain situation, it's not part of you. It's something that is still knowledge. It's something that you're still working with. It is not part of you. And the road between there being knowledge until there is understanding. Understanding is where something is part of you. It is part of your DNA. If you had to cut your finger, what would come out was that truth. If you were pushed at any moment, what would come out is that truth. And a large part of the church has a heck of a lot of knowledge. And a very small part of the church has understanding. And the road between the two is called sanctification. And in order to walk on that road, what what you need is courage. What you need is the courage to say, I believe so fully in the words that God has spoken over me that I will not let it go until I see, until I have the actual physical application in my life of what I speak all the time. How many of you speak a whole lot of truths about God, but you don't actually have any physical testimonies of those exact truths that you speak about? It's because you're on a journey from the one to the other. And a large portion of people will never get to that place where they see the physical outworking of God because the journey between the one to the other is difficult. And what you need on that journey is courage. That word courage, which means heart, means the seat of your emotions. It means your temperament. It means your state of mind, your deep and innermost feelings. And it also means your temper. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 4 verse 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything flows from it. What the Bible is telling us here is to guard your courage. God, the courage inside of you that says, I believe God has spoken and what he has said, I will see. And no matter how long this journey is, I'm going to walk along this journey until I get to the place where I have the physical outworking of the promises God has spoken. And everything flows from that place. The minute we allow one little bit of doubt into our heart, the minute we allow one little bit of fear into our heart, the minute we allow one little bit of questioning into our heart, it begins to fester. Why do you think gratefulness and thankfulness is so important? Because I'm not denying the existence of fear. There are times when I am really afraid. I'm not denying the existence of doubt. If I had to logically look at things, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not denying the existence of hardship and pain. But what I am saying is I'm choosing to lift my eyes above Love those things that want to capture my attention and I'm choosing to set my heart and my passion on Jesus. It is a full-time job and I cannot do it by myself. I can only do it with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That seat of courage reminds me of the fact that we are seated 
with Christ in heavenly places, which means every single part of this journey is inhabited, it is surrounded, it is propelled by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it comes from a place of rest. When I am resting in his goodness, when I am resting in his faithfulness, even though what I see with my physical eyes does not reflect what I believe God has said to be true, I will walk that journey where the head knowledge that I believe inside of me can never be stolen away. You know, I have never seen a bird fly off with an oak tree, but I have seen a bird fly off with a seed. And what God is looking for is people who are going to take those seeds firmly embed them into the ground, allow them to grow until they bear fruits of righteousness where other people can take those seeds and embed them into the ground. And once that tree is firmly planted inside of us, it cannot be robbed and it cannot be stolen away. You know, courage looks like a few different things. It looks like, number one, having the courage to dream. And I feel like a lot of us do have the courage to dream, even looking outside of our circumstances going, wow, life could look a little bit bigger, look a little bit further. But courage doesn't end there. We cannot just have a whole lot of dreams with no practical application. God has spoken, oh my goodness, look how amazing it could actually look, and that's where it stops. Courage number two also looks like the courage to actually see the circumstances that are around you. You know, so many of us use dreaming as an excuse to not have the reality of what's actually going on around us. But when I'm aware of what's really going on around me, that's the moment I can say, Holy Spirit, now you can invade this. I'm no longer running away from my pain. I'm no longer running away from my fears. I'm no longer intimidated by the doubt that surrounds me all the time. I can see it for what it is and I can stand firm and go, okay, this is what we're dealing with. Now I'm choosing to live by faith. Courage means to have the courage to confront your pain situations. Maybe your pain situation means having a very brave conversation with somebody. Maybe your pain situation is in your work environment or your family environment. But you know what? Once you've been able to dream the fullness of what God has for you, which is what he speaks over you, once you've been able to see the situation around you for what it is and stop running and hiding from it, you're actually then able to stand. And having done everything to stand, you stand. And you face those things that are coming towards you. But you know what? We all want to be able to face those things coming towards us without any um come back, you know, like I had the brave conversation and it was awesome, but I don't know if I have the courage for somebody to have that brave conversation with me. And the reality is there are things in our life that need to be confronted. There are things in our life that need to be spoken into. And courage is allowing those things to be highlighted in our own lives so that changes can be made. It's all very well being a big, brave warrior with the armor around us, but never actually allowing our hearts to be molded and to be made into the likeness of Christ, which is what this journey of sanctification is all about. Next, courage is to be able to have the courage to grow and learn and change. When those things have been highlighted inside of me, I need to now take the steps to move forward, to transform into his likeness and to become the person God has called me to be. It's no point knowing all the things in my life that need to be changed and then being completely tied up in those things and never moving forward. Those things don't have the power over me. Those things are highlighted so that I can take the hand of the Holy Spirit and move forward to be the person he's called me to be. And then I need to have the courage to live in a new reality, in that promised land, in the place that he's made for me, to actually establish a home there, to actually create a place where people can come and go and learn from the courage that God has put inside of me. You see, courage is not a moment. Courage is a lifestyle. Courage is every single decision moving forward in what God has called me to be. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong, take heart and wait for the Lord. And that word take heart means to have courage, to hold the line, to take a deep breath, and to not allow what I see around me to stop me from becoming the influencer that he has called me to be, the person that he's called me to change the world. So how do we live from that place of courage? I just want to quickly give you four points as I'm drawing to a close. Four practical points. Number one, we have to make a conscious choice to live from courage. In, Math, in Mark 5 verse 36, it's the story about the ruler whose child is sick and he comes to Jesus and he says, please will you pray for my child? And in the meantime, his servants come and say, she's already dead, don't bother Jesus, it's okay. And this is what it says Jesus' response was. Overhearing but ignoring what they said, Jesus said to that ruler in the synagogue, do not be seized by alarm or struck with fear, only keep on believing. 
Guys, there is a belief that God has given us and is our choice to go with that belief or to go with the fear, the doubt, the intimidation, whatever it is that makes us feel like we can't actually trust the fullness of God's word. It goes on to say that she was she was raised from the dead and the whole community was changed. I mean, how is that for influence that it took one guy to go, I'm choosing courage. In the face of everything that doesn't seem right, I'm choosing courage. And all of us have things that we trust in God for. And it seems like his, our prayers are not being answered and God is not hearing what we're saying. And what I'm exhorting you to do as a church is to choose courage, regardless of what our physical circumstances tell us. Because if the word of God has been spoken, he will do what he has said he will do. Even when it's tough and everything around us is shaken, what we need to do is choose courage courage. I remember Matt spoken about the story so many times, but when our little Leiden was born and he had a hole in his heart and the doctor called us up, uh, we were in the coffee shop and he called us up to tell us that there was something wrong with our newborn. I remember the words that went through my head over and over and over was, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. I will listen to what you have to say and I will not be afraid. And you know what guys, sometimes we should be talking to ourselves and telling ourselves the choice here is courage or the choice here is fear and I am choosing courage. When we do not make that choice, that choice will be made for us. And a lot of the time that choice is bent towards disillusionment, um, disappointment, discord, and all of those things that don't reflect the kingdom of heaven, where actually what God is wanting to do is fill us with love and courage. The second thing that Paul tells us about in that scripture in 1 Corinthians, it says, let love and kindness be your motivator. Let love and kindness be your motivator. That obviously, when we experience the full love of the Father, we are able to give love to everybody around us. Love that looks like grace, love that looks like redemption, love that looks like freedom. And when that is our motivator, there is nothing that we do that is that lacks courage. You cannot lack courage when you're completely motivated by love and kindness. And I want to remind you of our kindness movement that we have going. I am so excited because I'm starting to see kindness bloom everywhere. In every conversation I have, I'm hearing people go, do you know what happened to me? Do you know what somebody did for me? Do you know what? Things are happening, guys. And I want to say, church, congratulations. We are ramping up to a place where we are flowing in kindness like we can't believe. Keep it up. Because love and kindness need to be our motivator. That beautiful story of the woman um, who was a sinful woman and she went and broke her alabaster jar and washed Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair. Jesus said this statement. He says, he who has been forgiven much loves much. And as we're on this journey of sanctification and redemption, where we look more like him, the more we understand how much we've been forgiven, all we can possibly do is love. The natural outworking of belief is courage. The natural outworking of love is courage. The third thing is that courage needs to be exercised. We should be exercising our courage whether the result is success or whether the result is failure because just like any muscle, it needs to grow strong. And muscles ache after you've been exercising and muscles hurt, but the more you use them, the stronger you become. And you know what's amazing is that serotonin is released after we exercise our courage. And do you know that serotonin is the number one fighter of depression and of fear? And we need a healthy church. It's going to be a church who actually steps out in courage and starts contributing. And the third thing is that courage is contagious. Courage is contagious. It makes people around us want to stand up in a place of courage too, so that they can live in the fullness of what God has for them. Billy Graham says, courage is contagious. When a brave man makes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. If we want to be influencers, people who change the world, we need to be courageous people who in the face of fear, in the face of unbelief, in the face of, gosh, it's taken so long, has God forgotten about me? Choose courage that says he who has spoken is faithful and I will not stop until I see the fullness of God represented in my life. So Jesus, I want to pray for every single person who's listening today. And I want to release the ability to choose courage beyond our physical circumstances because he who has promised is faithful. I want to release the ability of influences in our community to stand strong on the promises of God, regardless of whether they've seen the fullness of that promise come to pass or not. Because everything that it takes to be an influencer is somebody who is completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And I want to release an awakening to the voice, to the moves, to the movement, to the nudging of the Holy Spirit as we choose courage because you are courageous and you never took a step back for us. You pushed in so wholeheartedly in everything that you did. 
in Jesus' mighty name. I want to encourage you guys, choose courage. Courage is contagious. Courage changes the world. It is not an action. It is in every single decision we make every day. You've got what it takes. May God bless you this week, sending you loads of love. Welcome back. What a wonderful word from Donnie. I hope that you're inspired, encouraged mm. to be influencers in your field and to take the world by storm. Yeah. So now we're going on to the on the wire discussions and we've got a wonderful couple that's gonna that's gonna just envision and just give you so much material and that wonderful couple is us so we'll see you there good morning oasis church it's such a great privilege to be on the wire this morning with this incredible couple this is dom and rhoda uh, and they're joining us for a discussion about real things uh, just some real stories about god and life and just what god is doing in this season and so we, we are excited to hear from you guys Ooh. but why don't we kick off just by telling everybody where uh you know just where you guys are at at the moment what god has done and bringing you to the midlands and to oasis and mm. kind of how you got here mm. and let's just let's just find out about the dom and the rotor <laughs> So we, um, so yeah, we're from Hillcrest originally, uh, KZN, uh, locals, but um, we decided to come to Howick um, two or three years ago, and it was really just a, a dream of coming out to the Midlands, you know, just living a little bit of the slower paced life, yes. the country life, and uh, that's, yeah, that's just what alerted us to coming out here and just, just, just changing things up a little bit, you know, from the city hustle into a bit of a slower, mm -hmm. slower country life. Yeah, and also having had uh, two, two of our three kiddies, mm. we wanted to um, explore a different life with our kids and introduce mm. them to more quality time as a family and just having those moments of being together um, and not just caught up in yeah. the busyness of life. Yeah. And then we started, we started uh, sort of exploring uh, churches in the area and we just, uh, we went to a couple and we, and we came here and instantly I think for us it was just home, you know, yeah. we felt... We felt comfortable. We awesome. felt um, we just felt like there was a good family here and something that we wanted to link into. It was more you actually first than yeah. me, um, yeah. but yeah, that's how we got you. Awesome. So, are you are you living the dream? Are you are, you came out here with a dream? Are you living the dream? <laughs> the country dream. Yeah. yeah kind there of. are moments. There are moments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's never linear, isn't it? Yes. Is it? Uh, yeah. God's gotta, always taking us on a journey. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to navigate. So we're navigating through needing to make decisions all the time yeah. to to chase after the thing that the value that we that we're chasing after. You know. Yeah. But yeah. definitely uh, the best decision we've ever made. Yeah. yeah wonderful. Yes. Well, this morning's uh, what I want to go after and just um, why well, it's, it's such a privilege to have you guys on this discussion is that all the way through scripture, we see how Jesus would uh, rock up in people's lives, probably at the time they least expected yeah. it. Um, at moments that they were mm. uh, on the run from something, discouraged, mm. hopeless, upset, whatever the case may be. Uh, and something happened in that moment that caused them to leave everything and follow him and their whole their whole life changed. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that, they began to influence the world uh, mm -hmm. around yeah, them uh, because of that. They were influenced so much by uh, the radical, real, on fire, passionate love of God. Yeah. Um, and I think that's so key in influence is that sometimes we want to look for the formulas. We want to look for the steps. You know, how do I influence the city? How do I influence my family? How do I influence people's lives? And yeah. uh, we've got these nice little nuggets of truth, which are great, but they're all founded within a real encounter mm -hmm. where God himself influences us. Yes. Uh, because we know that God, you know, we didn't choose God. The Bible says he chose us. Mm -hmm. And so True. he takes those steps towards us uh, and wants to encounter us in the midst of whatever we're going through mm -hmm. um, and so I want to ask you guys uh, just share some stories where God has influenced you because if, if God hasn't influenced us in a radical way we can't influence the world in a radical mm -hmm. way yeah. uh, so mm -hmm. tell us your stories mm -hmm. of being influenced by a loving powerful mm -hmm. a beautiful God mm -hmm. um, that literally has shaped your life and shaped your influence mm -hmm. yeah. so um, for me I encountered God I was about 21 years old and um, he met me at a youth meeting and my heart was pretty broken because I had just been broken up with, which wasn't great. And um, yeah, I just remember walking into youth and God just literally lavished upon me, just his love and his kindness. And um, week upon week, just the radical um, encounter I had with God was, was quite amazing. I, mm. I, I think there in that moment, I, he knew what I needed because I had always known him in my head as a, yeah. as a God who was up there and I'm down here. And I had never encountered 
his loving touch. I'd never mm. encountered the power of the reality of mm. who he is. Mm. And um, in those moments, I remember being deeply ministered to, mm. being deeply touched and transformed Friday upon Friday in youth. And um, it literally changed my life. Mm. I, um, I believe that in those times, God healed me. He healed mm. me of disappointments and heartache and just yeah, things that I didn't even know that were so deep in my mm. heart. And from that space, um, released me and launched me into worship and uh, leading youth uh, teams and just being completely transformed. And those were my first introductions to God being real, mm. not just head Good. knowledge, um, not Sunday That's upon brilliant. Sunday, just in church, but a real loving father. That's that good. was very brilliant. special. Yeah. So even though you grew up in church, yes. that was that was 21 years old, that you yeah. actually had a real encounter with yeah. God. Mm-hmm. And so maybe tell us, you know, like, what does that mean? You know, we talk about these encounters. We talk yeah. about, like, maybe just give us mm-hmm. a few words, like in that moment, yeah. like, what is an encounter? Mm. So for me, I remember thinking, because I was standing in youth and my hands were out and I thought, okay, God, I'm just going to raise my hands, which was quite a big thing for me because in our in here church, Dutch Reformed church, nobody raised hands, nobody clapped. No, it was very subdued back in the day. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I remember thinking I'm, I risked, I was like, okay, God, I feel very embarrassed. I feel very awkward Mm -hmm. to lift my hands. But as I raised my hands, the power of God just literally um, just was deposited into my body. And I, oh. I actually, I couldn't, I just couldn't stand up. <laughs> it was such a powerful experience. And I remember thinking, wow, oh, he's real. Oh, like he's actually real. Yes. Like he is, he is powerful. And it was, it was just such a, it, it was an electric, electrifying experience for me. Oh. And obviously loving, loving kindness of God yeah. just touched my whole body. And um, that's, that's for awesome. me. This was so real. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I mean, you share that story. I I grew up in a non-church family. So I have the complete opposite story where I never went to church. I didn't know anything about God. In fact, the only, the only time I I remember hearing about Jesus was going to Sunday school. I went twice in my life um, and I heard about this Jesus anyway. So I was sitting in the back of a hall and it was probably the early 2000s Mm. and there was literally it, like the atmosphere was charged that's what, all i can explain it was like and i thought yeah in my mind i was like obviously a skeptic i was i was sitting at the back with my hands folded i was like oh, you know are they, are they manufacturing this environment <laughs> is this is this all show yeah. and, and i remember you know like people were being healed i mean crutches were flying all, all over the place and wow. people were standing up out of wheelchairs and being healed i mean it was like a, it was a raw moment of just seeing the power of god at work wow. healing taking place mm. But, it, but as the guy preached and just shared his testimony and his story, um, it was like a tidal wave of love hit mm. me. And it was the wow. first time I, I described to people in my whole life that I ever encountered what love felt like. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that I was yes. good enough, that I yes. was accepted, that I was safe, that I was secure, that mm. I was... I was seen. And I yeah. remember the emotion of that moment going, if this is what love feels like, I want Once this. More. <laughs> and I remember lying down in the front when they did, I don't even know how I got there because it was like part of the encounter. I just, I wept and I ran mm. in front uh, and gave my heart to Jesus saying, I want this love. It was so mm. real. Mm. From being a skeptic, uh, like a hard-hearted uh, your, your teenager who really was just yeah. kind of scoping the scene out to an encounter with the love of God and the power of God that mm, literally wow. shifted everything inside of my life. So I totally understand wow. those yeah. moments. Wow. Those really and I think we need more of those yeah. moments yeah. in our yeah, lives because that's yeah. what influences the world around yeah. us. Yeah. You know, we can't manifest around us what we haven't received yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Dom, tell yeah. us about your story because mm. you've had some radical encounters. With yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're quite recently as mm. well. Um, moving out to the Midlands, we um, we had bought this guest house and, uh, and it ended up being a, like financially, it just wasn't a good, uh, decision and, and, and it was tanking and we were really going down. And, uh, the whole time, um, I was just, uh, trying to, uh, pull on faith in God and saying, where are you? What's going on? You know? And so I really got, I, I got to a place where I was really angry and really cross mm-hmm. because, um, totally different from your guys' stories. I've I've grown up in the church in a good church, charismatic church, my whole life. We've had I've had such good family and parents and mm-hmm. and good church upbringing. And um, I was a worship leader as well. I've been a worship leader for twenty years now. So, so you know I've, the deal. No, you know the <laughs> I've been part of this for like yeah. a long time, and I know God. I've experienced yeah. God. I've heard His voice. I've even seen an angel before. So I so so I've got good history. But it's like. Um, 
there was the reality, the encounter reality that you guys are talking about. And we were there and it was just month after month, just taking huge yeah. financial knocks. And then eventually I got to a place where I just got so angry and disillusioned because I'm like, God, I'm just, I don't know where you are, you know, because I know you, but I just don't know where you are. Yeah. And we had now just joined this church and, and we just basically, I was angry sitting at the back of the church and um, I was just frustrated. <laughs> and I was like, I'm over this. I'm over all of this. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't even in a good place. And uh, it was after one of the services and they just got up, uh, the worship team got up and they started singing. I closed my eyes and I, I, I can't, mm -hmm. can't just describe to you, but I was instantly transported back to our guest house, which is up in the Midlands. And I can't explain this, but Beautiful. I literally was there. Mm -hmm. I was taken there almost physically like i could feel everything smell everything see everything and and there was this lake and at the end of this jetty was jesus mm -hmm. and i never met him like i've met him like that before yeah. i've heard of him and i've sort of known him as distant but i i met him one-on-one -on -one, like mm -hmm. personal one-on-one -on -one, and that changed everything that mm. I, I i i honestly feel like my life will be marked by that moment yeah. when i literally met jesus the person the yeah. person of jesus mm. one on one Beautiful. That, and so and i've met him since then and i've had more encounters yes. like that and i just that thing for me is gold mm. Mm. and that's often i uh, was saying to dom after that encounter what i have experienced with encounters is that when you have an encounter, it unlocks. It's almost like God creates a space yeah, for you yeah. to go back there yeah. and have more encounters yeah. with yeah. him. Yeah. So it is. It's it's like a continual journey with him, yeah. encountering yeah. more and more and more. So it's super special. And just another word on that, Matt. Um, I often feel like we so want to be Western and so Greek in our thinking. you know. And so often I feel like we need to actually just let go a little bit mm. and engage mm a spiritual God, like, mm. and use our imagination and just, yeah. and just go there. You know, yeah. like we can't be so tightly wound up and think he's going to arrive like this. You know, I love what you said about that moment marked your life, mm. uh, because I think so mm. much of what marks our lives these days is kind of the things we do yeah. um, instead of what is God has done mm. in us and, yeah. and to us. Yeah. Um, and yeah. really that is so important. I want you to just maybe just take, take a minute just to unpack like, okay, you saw Jesus. What happened? Like, you know, I've I read Bible. I've heard stories. I've had my own encounters. But what happened for you yeah, in that moment? Yeah. Uh, I, how did he interact with you? What happened? You know, like, just give us some details. You know, it was an amazing moment because I was still angry. I was still me. So it wasn't like I was perfect and this was like a euphorial moment. It was like I arrived there. I saw him. He was sitting at the end of the jetty and he turned his head to face me. And I just knew in that moment that that was him. Mm. And it was in that moment. And I, I for church i wasn't able to sing this one song that we were singing at church was you're never going to let us down that was the theme song mm -hmm. and for me i was like i couldn't sing that and that's what we we're singing and i just remember clenching my lips because he said come and he put his hand next to him on the jetty and he said come sit with me and it was that engagement to come closer to come nearer to him yeah. and in that encounter i couldn't i actually just couldn't i was still angry dom and i was like i can't i really want to but i can't and so that's what happened in that moment. It was so real. And after those moments, I had other encounters where I ended up coming a little bit closer each time. So, yeah. so it's like a gradual. Yeah. 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 yeah he met me it's like a relationship. Was. It's like yeah. a step yeah. by step. He wooed you. Yeah. Yeah. And then you kind of started engaging yeah. and your yeah. heart yeah. got more and more close to him in that yeah. process. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wanna I wanna end with this and just ask you kind of guys one more question. Um, but but this calling of the disciples, I think I always get, I'm like, I read it in, in the Bible and I go like, what was it about Jesus that caused people to True. just leave everything, you know, like, mm -hmm. and go on mission, go get, you know, let their lives totally be overcome. And I was reading the calling of Nathaniel once, which is one that we don't often, you know, he's one of the apostles, we don't often talk about. Mm -hmm. And he, Philip came to him and said, come with me, I'm going, you know, I'm going, I'm go I've encountered Jesus, I'm going to Nazareth. Uh, and his response was, what good can come out of Nazareth? So he was completely angry, um, you know, like yeah, negative, yeah. like mm. this is not going to work. Yeah. And he encounters Jesus and Jesus calls him, uh, uh, he, he kind of calls him by his identity, not by his behavior. And he says this, he says, I saw you under the fig tree. Uh, and so in that moment, Nathaniel goes, oh my goodness, this, this, this God is real. Mm. And like I, he sees us, mm. you know, he sees us in yeah, the midst of our, yeah. of our yeah. pain and yeah. our yeah. anger yeah. and our, and our disappointment, yeah. or even just in our lives, yeah. whatever we're going through. Yeah. Mm. And he calls us into that place and it says, Nathaniel, at that moment said, this is the real God, because there was that encounter. Yeah. Like I've yeah. seen you, yeah. I know yeah. you. Yeah. 
Um, so what are, what are key things for you guys just to, just to help us out? You may be sitting there in your room, in your mm. living room going, yeah. well, it's never happened to me. Yeah. What are some of the nuggets of truth that you can just like share with us around just positioning our hearts to be ready for this, you yeah. know, to be yeah. anticipating, to be hungry for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just some things that you guys have yeah. learned along yeah. the way. Yeah. Well, I, I, for me, it's uh, to set aside time. Um, actually to make time to have those encounters with God, uh, to, to, to position a space in your life where it's, where actually you prioritize, Hey, like for me, I've had to mm. prioritize time. And in mm. those moments, as I oh, make good. time, God arrives and he's like, yeah, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting to meet with you. Yeah. So I just want to encourage yeah. you, make yeah. time, make space, mm. organize your life. Um, and he's faithful. He'll come. And on top of that as well, even he'll meet us in our time as well. So, yeah. so, so many times it can mm. be during a shower. Yes. Me on Hulu, it can be while you're driving. Sometimes yeah. I've found that he just meets me in the moment. Yeah. And another key that I want to give is that is that explore that. So you might just feel something or hear something, then yeah. go with it. Yeah. You know, like don't expect it in a certain way. Yeah. He'll just meet you in any way. Just yeah. go with it. Yeah. You know? Awesome. So, I mean, we want to encourage you today. Yes. Like God is wanting to see us. Yeah. God is wanting to know us just yes. like he did for Nathaniel, just yeah. like he did for his disciples, just like he did for all of humanity. Yes. Where he says, actually, this, this coming towards you yeah. um, and like the yeah. prodigal son, yeah. when he was coming home, feeling completely yeah. mm -hmm. ashamed and yeah. failure, the father ran towards him yeah. and he put his arms around him and he kissed him. Yeah. Um, that closeness is what yeah. God's called yeah. us yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, and so we want to encourage yeah. you. Let's get hungry for yeah. that. We can't yeah. influence the world if God yeah. hasn't influenced us yeah. uh, primarily. And so yeah. we, we, uh, we're hoping that yeah. this discussion is going to just spur something on yeah. inside of you, chances. create a hunger uh, yeah. and yeah. Yeah, closing word. Just, yeah. Just I just want to release encounters yeah. over you. I just yeah. want to release encounters, yes. fresh God encounters, one-on-one -on -one personal Jesus encounters yeah. over all of you. So receive yeah. that. Yes. I just yeah. believe this is going to happen. Yeah, get ready, you. guys. Yeah. God is wanting to meet you. He's wanting to love you. He's wanting to kiss you. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, get ready. Get yeah. your hearts yeah. ready. He's, he's, coming. he's, he's, he's coming on his way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well then, guys, thanks cool. for joining us. Yeah. Uh, share you. your encounters with us. We want to yeah. hear about them yeah. uh, because they just spur something on inside yeah. of, of, of those that hear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and Good God testimony. is, he's passionate for us. Yeah. yeah. We've got to remember yeah. that. Yeah. Like he's more yeah. committed to yeah. us than we are to him. He's more in love with us than we are with him. And he wants to make himself known to us so mm. we're ready Enjoy. are you ready what a powerful morning mm. together thank you for joining us have yeah. a wonderful week ahead yeah and, and yeah and always stay connected guys yeah. um even now on this platform you can just stay connected ask for prayer and just and just keep connecting and and obviously during the week as well mm. just contact the office or via our social media platforms just keep connected that's what uh that's what really gets us through and builds a community is yeah. his connection. So love you guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye.
the king. 